Hello and welcome to Prime Lenses. I'm Ian. Each week I speak to a photographer about three lenses that have meant something to them on their photographic journey. Or at least that's the plan. I have noticed recently I'm talking maybe a bit less about lenses, which I guess means that what I've been saying for a while is true, that the show is not so much about gear, it's more about making things, and the gear was an excuse for a conversation. Anyway, my guest this week is Stasha Schmidt, and we do talk about lenses a bit, and it's a lovely conversation because I like it when the guest gets involved and kind of interviews me a little bit as well. Stasha lives in Canada. She's a fine art photographer. She's my first fine art photographer uh, interviewee and makes incredible photographs and has been recognized recently by Leica. Uh, she's one of these annoying people who has picked up a camera very, very recently and is just incredibly good at it very fast. So I think you'll really enjoy this conversation with Stasha about moving from Canon to Leica, about photographing in Canada and about being brave enough to sit in very cold water to get the photo that's in your head and make it real. So here's my conversation with Stasha. My challenge is that I have two two kids and one is worried about what his parents think and one is not. Yes. <laughs> that also happens. Yeah, yeah. So so yeah, Lewis is brilliant. He's a rule follower and he's he's much more patient and much calmer, whereas Ben's yeah. a little firecracker. So yeah. yeah. Do you have a couple or one or I have uh two daughters. They are mm. sixteen and fourteen. Mm. So we're kind of past that phase that you're describing, yeah. but it just manifests itself in teenagehood where the first daughter is very studious and kind of you know likes to understand boundaries and and mm. how to work within those to be successful and yeah. etc she reads a lot and then the second one is um yeah more of that firecracker kind of <laughs> <laughs> yeah keeps yeah. us on our toes a thousand percent yeah, yeah. <laughs> i i feel like you know if he doesn't perform become a performer of some sort i think the world will be missing out <sighs> he's hilarious but they're both yeah. in brilliant different ways and lewis is going to do other stuff anyway i digress but yes it's wonderful to talk to you i've yes, really it's so nice to talk to you too ian i've been really admiring your stuff you're also though i've been looking at your work and and, and really enjoying it because you're the first um fine art photographer that I've spoken to as part of these interviews. Oh, okay. Well, what type of photographers are you usually speaking to? Well, so quite, I mean, it's a mix. So it's, it's a lot of people who uh, either talk about photography a lot. So they may not be professional photographers. They're often um, okay. like YouTube type people who review cameras and handle cameras a lot or enjoy them for mm -hmm. like their quality, but maybe photography isn't their full-time gig. Uh, yeah. We've had woodland photographers, um, which is maybe the okay. closest potentially mm -hmm. because you're finding form and story and things within within a scene uh, yeah. and then there's there's also the kind of more more often than not as well the the, the jobbing photographers right you're like uh, right okay. i have to do the thing i do so i'm a wedding photographer or i'm right. i'm asked to photograph you know i do 100 portraits for a thing or there was rob who was an early interview guest who was a motor gp photographer which was really cool okay. so completely mm -hmm. but but as much i mean rob's photos i, I want to talk to him because he's amazing because his stuff they look like paintings like they're incredible he takes mm -hmm. these very hard-edged clinical saturated but like very hard things machines and he does make them look phenomenal like it's just yeah. in a very painterly and creative kind of way yeah so but they're they are dealing with even if they have concepts and ideas for things they are dealing with the thing that is kind of in front of them and mm -hmm. so seeing your stuff i studied art uh, up until sort of my early late teens kind of early 20s and i've always loved painting go to museums mm -hmm. and look at art and so seeing your photographs and the way that they they there's a there's a real bleed and overlap between maybe how you think about your work potentially i think is like a, like a painter you know like you've talked about mm. having ideas for like your your um one of the photos you've took recently of like the person in the water with the trees around them was it drowning the, the, oh the, yeah that was uh yeah that that was actually a few years ago in the oh, fall right. and that's a self-portrait ah okay so there you go i set my camera up and yeah. i had done i had all the beta on when the leaves were going to turn and and oh, that wow. water level goes up and down depending on the season mm -hmm. so i needed to know when those trees were going to be in the water and I had kind of scouted the shoreline and figured out, okay, so this tunnel, that, and when the light mm. is going to be right here at about 4.30 yeah. p.m. coming over 
the um, coming over the mountain, then it's going to hit just right in that corridor. Yeah. And yeah, so I had the camera set up with the intervalometer and mm. just got in there. It's freezing. Yeah. It's glacial amazing. water. It's I really was going to ask if it was you. Yeah, I'll bet. Yeah. Wow. That's an amazing thing. How long yeah. do, so do these ideas sit with you for a long time generally, or do you have, do you kind of have them and then have to execute them quite quickly? Mm. Uh, this was an idea that is a bit of a famous spot in Western mm. Canada to shoot. Everyone loves to shoot these drowned aspens. Um, and it is truly very beautiful, but I just wanted to create kind of a different sort of scene and a feeling within that popular spot to shoot. Um, yeah. and so the easiest thing I could come up with is to insert myself into the scene, but not mm make it about myself, just make it about right. this figure. And uh, so I think I sat on that one for about a month. The other series, like the one that did um, so well with Leica, that was a two-year project of yeah. just, um, yeah, trying to if, um, figure out how to insert a, this surreal element into these settings that I find myself in that I'm really drawn to. So. Yeah. Yes. Was that ephemerality? Yes. That the yes. Collection? Yes. Yeah. Love those images. Because when, oh, when I was reading your sort of some of your bio and your background, you were saying about being influenced by science fiction. I was like, yes, that's, they've yeah. got really big alien Prometheus yeah. kind of energy and tone. Were they local to you, those photos? or? Uh, so those photos were actually from all over the world. So uh, Greenland, Mm -hmm. um, the Rockies here for sure, yeah. uh, Mongolia. And I, th I feel like I'm done with that series. Right. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I hauled all that fabric around for about two years everywhere I went. Right. And wow. to see what I could create in, in the moment when I was out there. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's really wonderful to see a different tone. Like for me personally, to look at a different tone of image, different type of image. It's like completely mm -hmm. different. It's not... It's not relying on like the story and a subject. You're you're instead you have something. I think it sounds like you want to create. Do you do you sketch yeah. them out first, or do you just have them in your head? Or I just have them in my head. Mm -hmm. I mean, I I have immersed myself in so much science fiction and fantasy right. since growing up. So, uh, yeah, this just those are, and I'm I'm constantly trying to not trying to. It's just my my creative brain is always mm -hmm. thinking of new ideas and. And sometimes I'll sit on them for a while. I have I have some upcoming ideas that I would like to mm. kind of try and start experimenting with. Um, yeah, it's I don't really think of myself as a landscape photographer, even though I'm out with landscape photographers sometimes, and we're shooting the same thing. But mm. I I, I want to try and find something more within the scene, if that makes sense, mm -hmm. like just to create a, a different type of story within the landscape. That's yeah. what interests me personally. Yeah. There's, yeah. there's immediately, I think, a story in your imagery. I recently spoke to a woodland photographer. I know a guy called Simon Baxter, and I've spoken to some landscape photographers. Mm -hmm. And there, it's interesting, like Simon's thing is very much, he wants his photos to look like as if you were there. So right. Very purposely setting things up. He's not he's not going down low. He's not going up high. He's not staging. You know, he's got very strict rules for himself mm -hmm. about moving things out of the way. Mm -hmm. That feels like kind of the opposite for you yes. I guess where you're you're you know it's it's artifice on purpose almost like yes yeah you know, yeah yeah absolutely um, I mean you know I there's only I don't really move the elements around so much so um I think on that uh with the figure floating in the water I think there was a, a like a willow branch I tied back with a strap mm -hmm. a ski strap I think I had in my camera bag um but so yeah, it's not like I can move a glacier around or lift sure. huge <laughs> rocks, but uh, yeah, introducing an element of uh, like that mystery or that surrealism, that's, that's what excites me. And, and it's not going to be like, somebody could go to that same spot and mm. you wouldn't know that that's where I was shooting because I'm trying to set my camera in such a way in order to usually fill the frame or to, hmm. yeah. Yeah. It's just, yeah. it's a very creative process for me. Yeah. Does it come from your love of science fiction? Was it like reading? Was it book based? Cause it feels like if you're doing a lot of this stuff in your head that maybe you've 
experienced a lot through reading like you're used to creating images in your mind yeah it's very it's very book based yeah (laughs) yeah right yeah yeah because the best science fiction really is like yeah absolutely absolutely in in so few words tells you it's why i found some writing because i I studied literature at university and it's why i find Mm -hmm. some writing that gets that we know like things like gormenghast that just go into such incredible detail about every scene and tell you and, and can we just get to the bit where you talk, like i'm i'm impressed that you've thought about everything it's almost like they don't trust the reader to <laughs> fill in any gaps it's why i could never read the da vinci code because at the beginning uh, of i think the third chapter when he's describing oh gosh, yeah. driving a citron down the champs elysees and i was like this is just too much like just yeah. stop it i just i just can we let the can story you just respect my intelligence a little bit more yeah Thank yeah you. let me let me just fill in the gap a bit yeah you know? <laughs> just, just a little bit but ah, people love it you, what are you going to do? Oh, well, thank you so on, much. On. I really appreciate that. Mm, no, it's really cool. I, I love the color and the tone, I think, of those images. There's a consistency across them, even if they're all in different places. I think that's mm. the, that also, I, I joke sometimes on the podcast, like, I'm a tourist. Like, I, I love photography, but I don't have the burden of it being my job. And, yeah. it, and my creative outlet is actually, he's like talking to photographers and enjoying mm-hmm. photography. Mm-hmm. Or whatever. But that consistency must be, and doing it for a few years, it sounds like you didn't have, you didn't know how many you were going to make at the beginning of that process. You just sort of knew that you wanted to, and that did they yeah. keep popping into your head through the course yeah. of that process? Yeah, yeah absolutely. And uh, I really like um, working with color in post. Mm. I think it's um, very interesting. I enjoy it. Mm. Um, and seeing... You know what? How can I use uh, color to reinforce the story that I'm trying to tell? Yeah. And that's a fascinating process for me. Um, yeah, so yeah. color is fun. Color is fun. I've been enjoying uh, Renee. I mean, obviously, I love color. I'm for the listeners wearing a ridiculous orange sweater. Um, <laughs> it's my favorite color. I, a lot of my life is orange. Um, but the um, I recently read the Joel Meyerowitz book uh, okay. on a question of color, which. Mm-hmm. I'd been going through a phase of shooting lots of black and white. I'm really enjoying it. I was like, maybe I could just shoot black and white. Maybe I could be one of those madmen who owns a monochrome camera, you know, and then right. just, you know, just, just rule it out. And then it was like, it was like reading one of those books that you read when you're trying to give up smoking or something. By the end of the book, I was just like, oh no, 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 no. It just, it was on a flight. It's quite a short book. And you can okay, I'll have to pick it up. It's, yeah, it's really interesting. So really my my stepdad might be next door reading it right now because I'm trying to get him to look at it. But it, it was one of those, those moments. Where I started the flight, opened the book, and by the end of the flight, I was just like, right, well, I can. It's going to be hard to justify black and white now because he <laughs> he shot color and black and white side by side, um, right, on film in like the 60s and 70s, I want to say, and just it's just so interesting because you don't ever see those sorts of things side by side. Like the, what you're talking about, the post processing is a very uh, personal sort of inward process that we don't mm-hmm. often share until we've arrived at the moment at the end. Like when when you're approaching your color work, how long do you give yourself to kind of- Oh, that's a really good question. Uh, sometimes I can, uh, I can finish an image in 45 minutes and mm-hmm. sometimes it'll take a month yeah. simply because I'll, you know, do a couple things and something's not quite right, but I can't figure out what it is. So I need to give my, myself some time to let it marinate, to, to think about Mm. what I want it to be. Yeah. So yeah, it takes time. And that's actually one of the interesting things I've noticed about moving from my Canon system to the Leica system is the colors are so different. Mm -hmm. And, uh, when I, when I first started shooting with the Leica a couple months ago, and I would just go through the same processes with the color. And it's like, this is terrible. What what am I doing? It it was it was a disaster. I had to completely relearn how to use color within the the Leica digital negatives. That was interesting. Yes. Yeah. I was not expecting that. No, I, I it's people who move between systems a lot. I'm always surprised by that. Because I, I have mm. um I have a one camera rule to try and keep my life simple. Yeah. Uh, like, so I just have my M. That was a kind of like a white whale camera. Um, before that, I'd used the Rico, which I think the GR, which a lot, which I think was very similar color, like from a color perspective. I think they, they're probably mm-hmm. closer than they are apart. And I'd used Sony before that. And the, the A7, the original A7 colors were kind of all over the shop. And right. I, I was never, was never totally 
like won over by stuff like straight out of the camera there. But I think I've always felt like, cheat, like that's cheating a little bit because I don't, I, I'm not, I don't know, I'm not telling, I'm, I'm trying to document what's in front of me. So that's why yeah. I'm really interested in your approach of the colors, presumably for you, can be anything you want them. To, you can make yeah. them into whatever you want, I guess. Yeah, so absolutely. It's, a, it's an artistic process for me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's um, and it will be different as I move forward with the Leica, simply because it's a it, it's a totally different process. I mean, I get some of those images like just regular snapshots when I'm out shooting in the mountains. I'm like, I don't even think I need to edit this. Like, this looks really yeah. good. <laughs> yeah. no, it's not Whereas my good. Canon, I would just like throw everything everywhere and see what happened. Yeah, um, it but, is nice yeah. to, to not have to fiddle with it. I have to say, like, because that's yeah. something you see when people online. I, I saw something recently made me chuckle, uh, which was online. Someone was saying that Leica selling the Q2 for six thousand dollars or whatever they were selling it for, or the Q3 was um, was like uh, it was an assault on customers, and you know they okay. shouldn't do it. And I was sort of like, well, they are they they're in the business of selling these to F1 drivers. Like, I don't think anyone's been harmed. Like, no, I, I, no, I it's okay. It's okay. I don't think someone is yeah, <laughs> accidentally going, oh, I've got this Q3. I guess I won't feed my family for a few months. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. I think it's going to be okay. It's a, it's a certain demographic, yeah. Yeah, I can see their point. But, and and there is, I suppose, it's very, it's too easy to sit and go, well, either A, there are two ends of the spectrum, which you just, there's too much noise around probably, which is like, one mm -hmm. is like, well, you can do anything with any camera if you want to. You can probably make mm -hmm. any camera look like any other camera if you if you want to, like mm -hmm. capable to shoot raw and off you go. And then I guess the other side to it is if you have the means and you like the look of a certain camera, just buy that one. Yeah. In the same way that like Fuji's system does those wild film simulations, which are cool. Mm -hmm. just, if you like those, just get those. Like I feel yeah. like we need an arms around the world come by our moment for yeah. photographers. It's like, okay. Whatever yeah. you're shooting, it's okay. Yeah. What if, what if it was just fine? Just have fun um, exactly, <laughs> with whatever you're exactly. doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If it's not fun, why are you doing it? Well, I mean, I, you know, obviously people do it for work, but yeah, uh, yeah, no, of course. But, but the tool's got to fit you. On the subject of your shiny new SL3, then, which can be a nice segue, perhaps onto onto a lens. Yeah, right? absolutely. How are you finding the kind of? Do you because it's it's a big hunky metal thing <laughs> compared yeah. to it's a very different approach to making a camera to some other makes isn't it you, yeah i was shooting with the canon um r5 so it is uh a, it's about the same size to be honest mm -hmm. um it's a little heavier there's a little more metal involved with the like a sl3 um i actually i have one canon lens left to sell i've sold right. all of my canon gear mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh because i needed more lenses for the yeah. for the Leica. so yeah it's time to create some income there to mm. to indulge that but uh yeah the the process has been interesting switching over. It's a very different um, sort of interface. And I knew that R5 so well, I could use it with my eyes closed in the dark. Like I just didn't even yeah. think about it. Um, so, but what I did, what I thought was really, really cool with the SL3 is I went through and created uh, different profiles for myself in that menu. Mm -hmm. So like a profile for Astro, a profile for... Um, self-portrait shooting with the intervalometer, a regular profile, a profile for wildlife if I'm out and there's a grizzly running out. I'm just, mm -hmm. um, so I'm excited to have all that. And then it's so customizable within each of those profiles. So different buttons that or different functions that I'll know I, I'll use for like, for instance, with Astro, mm -hmm. um, I can set those buttons up and the dials up perfectly to yeah. so that i don't have to think about it in the dark and i'm excited nice. about that for sure yeah yeah no it's nice Th that was something i was going to ask you about actually when you were saying different settings or different things because you do seem to turn your hand to everything and you seem to be one of those terribly annoying people who's like <laughs> making beautiful images of animals like the 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 lion in the tree with the moon behind like just and oh, the zebra and stuff thank like, you. oh just so cool and you know i get red squirrels occasionally it's not quite the same thing um <laughs> But that and then landscape and then your art photography, I was going to ask whether there was any type of photography maybe that comes and goes or that you loved at one time and maybe you've done it too much and it wanes now. Um, yeah, yeah. so wildlife is definitely, I'm, I don't consider myself a wildlife photographer. Mm -hmm. uh, it's definitely a um, situational 
Like if a really cool animal puts itself in front of me, am I going to sure. take a photo? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But I'm not going out. Like I, there's so many wildlife photographers here where I live and uh, they track wolves for years. And I, I don't have that sort of, you have to have a lot of patience mm, to be yeah. a wildlife photographer. And I, I don't have that. And plus you can't boss the animals around to get them no. to sit <laughs> perfectly in the frame. So <laughs> that's yeah. annoying. <laughs> <laughs> there was a huge coup. I feel like I'm going to say it was a few years ago and then probably find out it was like a decade ago. But the Wildlife Photographer of the Year, the British award that's, um, mm -hmm. in London every year, there was a big coup about that, about a wolf a few years ago. There was a photo of a wolf leaping over a gate. Um, okay. And I think it won. And it was, and there was a lot of like, well, to catch a wolf jumping a gate like that, they must have used a flash and they must have done certain things. And maybe and there was a suggestion they trained it. And it's like, well, oh, I don't know if it matters. It's an incredible image. I think you know? wolves are pretty hard to train. Yeah. At I, least Canadian I, wolves. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I think it was in Germany. I want okay. to say it was maybe in Germany somewhere. That was, if it wasn't the, it, it might have been, I'm definitely showing my age now. It might have been the year I got my first SLR because I, I decided I was going to get one. And I went to the Wildlife Photographer of the Year Awards and I looked, okay. I couldn't decide between Nikon and Canon. Okay. So I looked at who had who had more, and there were more Nikon images that year in the finals and Canons. And so that's reason. what you bought. Yeah, I bought a Nikon, yeah. um, and I loved it. It was great. Um, but yeah, a little D forty, really good. Six Cute. megapixels. Oh I've wow, come a long way. Six oh, so megapixels. far, yeah. Wow. Six APS-C megapixels because the, the SL three is what is that sixty as well? It's no. sixty five yeah. or sixty four, I think. That's I don't, I don't do great with keeping those technical no, things in my it's, brain, but it also doesn't actually matter. Yeah. Like I, yeah. I shoot mine at 36 cause it does the the fun thing where you can kind of make, you can choose your image size effectively. Oh, okay. So it, mm -hmm. it, it's kind of three. So I just set it to the middle one cause right. I'm not bothering the size of buses or stadiums. Yeah. I think yeah, 36 yeah. megapixel image is probably, <laughs> probably enough latitude for, a, for a tourist. For what you're doing. Um, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But yeah, so the so your first lens choice then potentially of your three, if you if you have a lens that's maybe like that you like or a focal length that you gravitate towards. This is kind of the fun bit because often people mm -hmm. do with the formula. Yeah, so yeah, okay. There are no rules. So um, I I with the camera that Leica gave me, it came with a twenty four to seventy two point eight, and which I've never used before. And so that was very, I, and I'm starting to really love it. Like uh, next Monday, uh, I'm flying in a helicopter out to a glacier to camp for the week. And um, so I, I, that's the lens I'm going to use for mm -hmm. the child. Side. I think it'll be fantastic to get yeah. the peaks. And it's not so wide that I'll be mm -hmm. getting the inside of the chopper. But I, I just, I really like the versatility with that lens. Mm. Um. I, but I did just buy a used 90 to 280 2.8. Oh, wow. And I got a fantastic price on it. And I love it so much. Yeah. Like, I love it. That would be very cool. Yeah. And I'd love, love a lens like that. It'd be very nice. I think the, the, the M goes as high as 135. Okay. And then you've got to focus it with a rangefinder patch. <laughs> Right. So good luck. <laughs> I've never shot with a rangefinder camera. I don't know what that would be like. It, so initially, for me personally, it was very confusing. Initially, mm. it was it was kind of a hard thing. Like um, it was funny. M shooters. I've got a few close friends who are M shooters, and they kind of rallied around in a way. Okay. There was it was like like when you're when you let people know who've got children, you let people know you're also going to have children, and they sort of get around you and they go, right, okay, yeah. There's some there's some stuff we'll you need to. You. It'll be there's okay. Some stuff you need to know. <laughs> <laughs> like and, it, and I think especially like for me who's going to be a new like I remember this with when I was going to be a new dad my mate Dave was like very like right okay and we need to talk about some stuff but yeah so it was the same with the range finder the focusing is so different and you're looking off to one side you're not looking through I'd shot mirrorless for years for like over a decade um, or used point and shoots which were showing you you know what you're going to get effectively mm -hmm. through the screen and so there is a definite difference to that but what's really nice and i think this this is teaches us what it was like to shoot with film as well is that, that you you grow in confidence the less right. the less you're looking through a screen because yeah. 
that what you were speaking to earlier about dialing your settings in and kind of nice it's like the the analogy i always do is like you know in the movies when people are really like cool assassins and they can dismantle a gun without looking at it and put it back to right 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 dark, right it's it's the nerdy image making version of that like if you can drive that's why i like the m because everything's on a switch i think it's one of the reasons right. that the fuji system is so popular as well as the same sort of thing like the dials and stuff have been very consistent through versions and so you can just dial in exactly what you want without really having to look at it for me a rangefinder camera is really nice because your aperture is on the bit that's attached to the lens so when i'm thinking about like right what, what looks through it's like it's where you expect to it's like the gear shift in a car is like right that's the gear thing and that's the indicator so you've got a kind of button for everything mm -hmm. and there and there's only really the three things you need to worry about so it's quite you know i'll let myself auto iso drive and then actually a rangefinder patch because it's a window to the world and your eye is really good at adjusting for low light mm -hmm. there's something nice about that that it just adapts to the light conditions you never you never have to kind of have that moment of switching especially as i get older my eyes are not as maybe as great as they yeah, were it changes doesn't it it's, it's just happening to me in oh a real, my in a god very it, real way i didn't really expect that mm. and i've been wearing like reading glasses now for a few months and and i've noticed mm -hmm. in low light i've become one of those annoying yep. people in restaurants are like why is it so dark in here i can't see anything <laughs> yeah yep. i'm taking things over to a window now yeah. in a way yeah. that i didn't like the, yeah. the, the office where i'm doing this i have three windows i have a window on my right and then two in front of me and it's it's great for that yeah but yeah i know what you mean it, it's my friend who's a few years older than me warned me this would happen and i went Oh, no, James, I think you find I'm never going to age and my hair color will definitely tell you otherwise. But yeah, so no, it's but that is nice rather than looking at a screen, but right. looking through a little window that's actually got light in it and frame lines. Um, yeah, I always find that. looking through the viewfinder um, a deeper sense of what I'm shooting when I'm looking through the mm -hmm. viewfinder. Yeah. 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 Raising it. I think the other thing that's fun about rangefinder cameras is that they're not, they're, they're small. So your camera mm. looks like a child's drawing of a camera, right? It's like, it's quite big. Yeah, it's, it's, like, it's, it's quite large. Interesting. Yeah, but, it, but it's what people think cameras look like. Right. And what's nice about the, the M's and the Fuji systems is that like, they're small and people yeah. don't really, you know, so if you're, if you're trying to take documentary style photos, or maybe you're at a family event or something like that, people assume either that you're shooting film or that what you're shooting can't possibly be really be used for anything because that looks like it's ancient or, you know, whatever. Right. Actually. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, walk around on the street and sit it under a jacket. I'm always amazed when people use cameras like um, SLRs and DSLRs for street. And, you know, they run around, sometimes they'll run around with like a, or a medium format and they'll use them for street photography. I'm just, that, that must be, you're making a statement. Yeah. 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 That's um, that's such a good point. When I uh, I had a little Fuji at one point when I was kind of in, um, I used to travel in a little more sensitive areas, and I didn't want to have a, a big, kind of conspicuous mm -hmm. camera. Um, but I've since given it to my daughter. So, I uh, yeah, I have to figure out a solution for when I'm traveling in areas where I don't necessarily want to be advertising that I have quite that much year on yeah <laughs> that is the downside like i've um a guy in san francisco at the leica store showed me a, a trick for like putting your camera across your body under a jacket because i quite like to wear a jacket like right a, sort of loose like a canvasy jacket or something mm -hmm. and he was like and then basically you can wear it across and sort of sling it on your like under your jacket and again mm -hmm. it's like if you have a small camera with small lenses so like i tend to run it's easier. 35 prime it's quite small just yeah. under there my, my size 35 to eight just hides away and then you just pull yeah. it and get a photo and get on with your day um yeah i met some proper little gangster street photographers when i was in san francisco last actually oh, okay running around with range finders they were shooting film they meant it wow. i'll send you a picture of them afterwards they yeah you get please. a portrait of like the four of them together and if you yeah. look at them it's like i feel like i photographed like the next joel meyerowitz or something like that like an oh that's really like, cool I feel they were so cool and they were just on this really busy corner near near the moscone um mm -hmm. there's like a trader joe's on the corner as you walk mm -hmm, down. Mm -hmm. and yeah they were there and i'd i'd been at meetings and then i'd ended one meeting with a beer and i'll be honest i was a little tipsy and okay, I wandered up fine. to them because no they, they were with their M and they were like, and I was just like, wow, is that an M? And they went, yeah. And just, and we had a lovely little chat. It was great.
Oh, really that's nice. so cool. And then it's it, not to have a camera out <laughs> in, in, in San Fran. It was like, hide it away. Yeah. Um, that's a, it's an interesting thing about like a culture that I've been introduced to is there's a lot of street photography mm. and I'm not necessarily exposed to that just geographically in Canada. There's yeah. not a lot of street photographers. So that's been kind of a new area to be exposed to. Mm. And um, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. I don't, you've that's so one many, genre I don't shoot a lot of. It's street no. photography. You've got so many big wide open spaces. I guess it just doesn't really attract it. Like why would you be looking in there when you could be looking out there? Yeah. And I don't know, maybe we don't have quite the beautiful cities and and people in Calgary or in Canada can be just bundled up all the time. And yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know if we're very interested. Maybe we might be boring. That's why. <laughs> well, I've, I've visited uh, Vancouver. I have some friends there. I visited them. That's a beautiful city. got married a while ago. Yes. Stunning place to visit. Mm -hmm. I did. I did take lots of photos there with my Nikon while I was there. Okay. Um, I still have those somewhere scrolled away, probably mm -hmm. on Flickr somewhere because it was 2008, I think. Right. So how long have you been shooting for? So I probably started shooting um, properly. It was 2007. I think I bought my first. I decided okay. I was going to, up until that point, Canon Ixus, little point and shoot. Mm -hmm. those photos. I'd always grown up around photos. My dad was really keen on photography. He was a photo, I would say photojournalist in the, in the loosest sense. Like he would, in his retirement, he basically right. made beer money by wandering around and taking photos. And because um, you can, when you're retired, just have a mm -hmm. camera in the car, end mm -hmm. up talking to someone and then make a story out of the person you right. met who turns yeah, out you have that a brewery. Kind of time. Or that, yeah, yeah. And he would just find it and then he would sell them for you know, you know, hundred quid to a local newspaper mm -hmm. or a local magazine, and 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 he was the, it's it's funny because when I was looking at your stuff and you were talking about like the like a prize and you have to write something and have the images and it's, it's quite a lot of work to pull it all together. Yeah, he was that he was that in a really small way, like all the time. He's just like okay. if, you, if you if you're solving someone's problem fundamentally, then you're gonna like you're gonna be successful. So he had the words, he had the pictures, he could just he could rock up and he's giving it to a news desk and he's like, there you go. And also had the added bonus of being in his late seventies and early eighties, which is just hilarious that this mm -hmm. dude turns up and he's just very chatty. So, but yeah, so I've been shooting 17 or so years, 18 years, something like that. Okay. And I'm trying to be good at it probably for the last 10, like wanted to be good at it, mm -hmm. wanted to understand it. Um, and yeah, so that's why I find, and it's not my day job. So I find that I love, talking to people who get to do it for their day job and <laughs> you know hear about that's it. That's really cool. Do that's you remember cool. your first camera and when you first picked one up? Did you grow up around it? Or? Um I didn't really grow up around cameras. No. I grew up in the bush in northern uh Canada and so mm. I was very isolated. And I think my parents maybe had a camera, but um but I've I yeah, so I didn't grow up around it is what I'm saying. And then um I knew I really liked photography and I I was gifted a a Canon I think a couple like a year or two after my first baby and so mm. I was taking pictures of just the kids like just as a hobby thing I mm. I look at all the photos now and they're not bad like I had an eye for composition for sure but it's like lowest res jpeg and mm -hmm. yeah so and then uh when I turned 40 um, and my kids were both a lot more independent. I had purchased a, a Canon DSLR and I decided that I was going to learn how to take photos of the stars. I didn't know how to use it. I didn't know what to do with it. And so I think it was in 2019, I went out mm. into Banff and just mm. took this workshop, this two night workshop. And so I've been shooting, I guess, since uh, early 2020. and. Yeah, that's nice. since then I moved from that Canon, that Canon is a 5D something to the R5 and now this camera. So I've had three cameras total. Nice. And two of them mirrorless as well, which is quite nice. Yeah. 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 And one of the first people I've spoken to who, like me, also really came up through digital. There's not really yes. a lot of kind of because there's sometimes a lot of hand wringing over whether we should be shooting film and things like that. And I'm, wow, yeah, I'm also I'm not, unburdened by that, really. I, that is not something I think about. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's nice here not having yeah. to develop 
and send things yeah, away. Yeah, it's fun. It's so yeah. fun. And, and you can have such control over your files. And yeah, um, yeah I, 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 don't, I don't think about it. <laughs> no, no, no. And I, I do allow myself instant photography. I will say instant okay. film is, is still a magic trick and yeah. it's still lovely. And Polaroids hit hard. It's just they're like three bucks a shot. And so it's just a bit like, oh, yeah, this, I hope this. I actually, out. someone did give me an old refurbished Polaroid and sometimes I pull it out. Yeah. It's, it's cute. Yeah, yeah, they're really fun. Is it one of the little box? Little it's box like blue box? and it's mm. quite large actually. And the picture yeah. comes out the front. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, neat. Yeah. Mostly when uh, we're drinking out at the cabin, then I take out the Polaroid. <laughs> yes, but they're perfect for stuff like that. It's, do you know, yeah. they have um they have a genius ad campaign. I was talking to a, a New York photographer named Sissy Lou a couple of weeks ago, and she's doing some stuff with them at the moment. And she's been given the brief, which is around they're in pursuit of imperfectionists. That's what they mm. want. And mm -hmm. I was like, that's, that's very good. That's clever. That's leaning into the fact that, you know, because they're so sensitive to temperature and light and just everything that just yeah. you, you really have to get it right. Um, but they're new, newish, uh, the i2, the Polaroid camera they've just released, okay. which is fully manual. I think it's the first time that there's oh, really? an out of the box, fully manual Polaroid camera. Hmm. And it's, it's mega. It's really, really great um it's got a beautiful lens that the, being able to dial in the settings and stuff yourself and just choose what you're exposing for and just having that level oh uh, yeah that's really cool yeah it's really nice it's a i mean i think a 600 hundred dollar polaroid camera is a is a sort of specific weapon for a specific person yeah but wow. it's it's the best one of those like yeah it's, yeah it's you know well and actually um leica did an instant they do the instant now the sofort too but when mm -hmm. the original sofort came out my wife bought me one. I tell this story too often on the podcast, so apologies to listeners, but it, she bought it me as a joke because she was like, this is the only Leica you'll ever have. Ha ha ha. Because <laughs> at that point I was, I was saving up for a queue and I would, I would get close to kind of be able to afford it. And then I'd talk myself out of it because it was a lot of money. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, yeah. And so, but that is an example of where you put instant film in a camera that's just even just a little bit better in some ways like maybe a slightly better lens or you know some slightly more control over your exposure and suddenly it makes instax film look incredible and so are you using instax film in that like a okay yeah and do you yeah, use yeah. that quite a bit yeah the the so far i mean it's a high days and holidays camera you know like it's okay, a, right. like you saying like at the cabin you know it's a it's a fun one to take out but it makes lovely images it makes really really nice pictures they don't oh, do a pure analog one anymore okay um, so far two is a it's a bit of a cheat because it's a printer inside a camera body, effectively. Okay. So they're kind of cheating a little bit. It's a five yeah, megapixel yeah. digital camera that then... if you, It has a printer on the inside. Yeah, and if you crank the little lever, it prints one out. And you can also print pictures from your phone and stuff like that. So I have one to uh, my neighbor okay. of a squirrel with sunbathing on her bench. Uh, right, recently. gotcha. So, yeah, so you can print from... It's very versatile. Like, it's the most affordable Leica there is, and it's kind of mm -hmm. cool. Uh, yeah, but it's not the same as pure, like pure analog does yeah. have a kind of a, a texture to it. Yeah, um, yeah. A feel to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I noticed on the subject of pure analog and pictures, you've got a printer behind you. Like, are you printing? When did printing come into your? Yeah, there it is. Um, <laughs> when did that come in? Because that's that's a serious printer. Like, you yeah. And this uh, this I got a, a friend was selling this. Um, they had they bought it and they hadn't used it so i was like i'll take it off your hands and learn how to print mm -hmm. it's yeah, frustrating yeah. to get the yeah. color rendering correct um yeah. so i'm still it's a it's a, a thing in progress yeah i have not mastered printing yet and i work with a great printer here in calgary who does fantastic work so it's it's like a little mm -hmm. side hobby yeah, with all the right. time that i have <laughs> Yeah, because you've covered a lot of ground. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We're, both, we're both yeah, I, with time. In four years, <laughs> exactly. uh, yeah. That's what I was thinking. I covered a lot of ground. Age. Yeah, um, I'm 46. Yeah. No, uh, I um, yeah, I'm 45. So mm -hmm. basically the same age. Um, but yeah, so because I, I started printing, the thing under the cover behind me there is a, okay. is is my prograph as well. Same thing, and and I've. I've definitely enjoyed using it and dabbled, but and the prints are gradually getting larger as I gradually develop the right. confidence. But I first printed when I first printed something that was even A4 size, 
I think there was a moment where I was like, you, you look at it on the screen, you're like, this is a cool photo. This is going to look great. This, this is going to look so good. Yeah, I'm yeah. going to frame this and put it in my house and everyone's going to say, wow, where did that come from? <laughs> uh -huh. And you're going to go, it's not even Ikea. That's not even, that's actually mine. But then I found the first things I printed, all I could see was the things that I kind of missed because it was yeah. a different feeling to yeah. have it in physical space. Did you have the same experience? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I was printing an image of a cheetah from uh, the trip to Tanzania that we did in uh, December and January. And I, I printed it out. I loved it on the screen. Like it looked fantastic. I was like, this is, this is it. This is going to be like my wildlife photo. And I printed it out and I was like, why is the cheetah so green? Like, when did mm. that happen? Mm. Why did this color why is this color rendering so disgusting? Like, yeah. <laughs> oh no, I don't yeah. know. No, so. it's, I don't know. It's, there's a world of pain in color calibrating screens yeah. and matching to printers, not to mention printers are such a lower dynamic range than yeah. the screens and sensors mm -hmm. we're getting used to. It's kind of, yeah, I think I our know. eye is so spoiled by what we see mm. on our camera and on our screens that when we're looking at an actual I mean, I love looking at images printed out. I mm. think that's how we should be looking at them. Yeah. But we get so used to these certain types of colors uh, on computers and on screens yes. and we're not seeing yeah. them printed out. And then we think something's wrong and it's like, no, we're just used to these hyper saturated images, right? Yeah, on so, HDR screens. Whilst yeah. we continue to check in, like with the, I feel like this is all partly therapy as well. Two photographers checking in on each other. Like, how's your photo book habit going? Have you, have you gone down that rabbit hole yet? Um, no. Okay. No, I, uh, I, I need to make some photo books. I like, yeah, I'm just trying to figure my life out. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> it it feels like it's on the list. You're like, okay, it's Brian, on the list. I yes, can get and to I'm. This. You know, there's like updating the the website. Uh, yeah. networking with galleries, putting together shows, yeah. making photo books, trying to figure out like, there's just so much stuff. Yeah. It's a difference, isn't it? Between like, presumably your friends who don't, who aren't photographers assume that your job is just going out every day and taking photos. Yeah. And like it's so easy. Yeah. But <laughs> you have to become like a, a graphic designer and uh, mm -hmm. you have to know how to write and you do marketing and there's so many yeah. things. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've fallen down the rabbit hole recently of other people's photo books. I'm not making very many like printed thing. I'm printing some images, but yeah, I'm definitely getting into a bad habit of, yeah, I'll buy that Saul Lighter book, which I'll look at all the time and it's still on the right. shelf and I haven't opened it just yet. But, oh, are you, okay. So you're asking uh, like how many photo books do well, I yeah. have? Do, is that oh, I thought you, you were talking about well. making my own. No, um, but it was interesting. It's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I have, uh, I recently just purchased a couple more. Yeah. I'm looking at my shelves in the back uh, there. Right. There we go. Uh, yeah, I definitely, I have perhaps more photo books, uh, than I have time to read or Excellent. absorb. Oh, good. Good. <laughs> so uh, yes, I'm yeah. part of the support group now. Thanks. Yes. No, no, that's good. That's good. The Kiwis have a phrase, go hard or go home. And I think you yeah, just embrace yeah, yeah. that with every aspect of this. Yeah. Yeah. What was it, do you think, early on that made you want to pick it up as a as a gig then? Because you, if you started kind of picking up cameras and enjoying image making, and, and the reason I'm asking this is because it's, it's quite common in people I speak to that one day they just decide. And I love mm -hmm. that. Like one day there's a, there's a, because obviously there's a creative aspect to it and there's an enjoyment to kind of like mm -hmm. making something with your hands and a craft. But it feels like there's also an element always of like, I'll, I'll show you I can do this. I've got, this is in my head. I'm going to make sure you, I'm going to make you look at it. And I quite like that. It's a little bit. Yeah. Was that kind of how it was maybe a little bit? For you yeah, I would or? say so. Yeah. Absolutely. After um, I learned how to use my camera in the dark, mm. I just decided that this was what I was going to do. Yeah. And I just threw myself into it 100% and it's all I did. So uh, on backcountry skiing trips out for five days in the mountains, everyone had their gear and I mm. had my gear and a camera and people would just have to get used to uh, me hauling out my camera and being like, okay, mm -hmm. so I'm shooting now ski along. And yeah, you get used to being the annoying one who's constantly asking to stop the group, <laughs> but yeah. it became a very real thing pretty quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, nice. 
I love it when people fall in love with hobbies so fast and it becomes like, no, this isn't just a hobby anymore. This is a, this is something like the, I was meant to do. Yeah. Uh, it was, a, it, I don't want to, the word obsession has weird connotations to it, but it hmm. definitely became something that, um, this, uh, like it is absolutely my creative outlet hmm. and I could, maybe could have gone with something else, but this is what I was, this is what I'm going to do. This yeah. is what I want to do. This is what feels right. So let's just go. Yeah. No, I love that. Yeah. I asked um, a photographer, Tiffany Rubert, who I interviewed last week. She f she shoots on film because she's a mad mm. woman. Um, but she was saying, I was asking her because a lot of her portraiture and, and photos are very, like, of groups of friends. It's quite intimate and close. And I was like, you know, how do people feel about that? And she just answered in a, a wonderfully sort of French way. Because she's just like, well, if you're with me, this is just what's going to happen. Yeah. And I love that because I <laughs> I don't have that bravery outside of my family. And she's just like, no, I'm, I've got a camera. I'm going to make images. People like it, actually, I find. Mm. Like once they get used to, um, like in my situation, once your friends get used to you slowing them down a little bit, they like having the record of what we did and they appreciate it. So they start to indulge it a little bit. Yeah. yeah, especially when it's done by someone who's capable. I feel sometimes you have to win people over, you know, yeah. as well. Like you have to show them that it's great. Yeah, absolutely. Gonna, yeah, I, I joke with the boys when when my boys are sick of photos. I go, look, I'm making your childhood look magical. Yeah, yeah. Just you're gonna appreciate this. Don't worry about yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna be okay, guys. You look great. But yeah. <laughs> Do you presumably you're on your? I, I was assuming that that problem would go away over time, but actually, if as they become teenagers, I guess that just becomes more prevalent like don't yeah you won't be that. shooting them when they're teenagers no <laughs> no get it in while you can because okay. the moment they turn like 12 they're done with you putting a camera the 90s on to 80s for? <laughs> <laughs> stand a long way back yeah exactly yeah yeah, yeah. no they have no That's patience funny. for you no when they're teenagers <laughs> how much are you traveling for work then now if you're you know you've gone through a period of i guess being hit up like i sort of contacted you for interviews and stuff like that like presumably you're going through a really busy media period like you're saying talking to galleries and relationships and stuff does that see you having to travel around a lot or has, has um, everything changed post pandemic is it all mm, this yeah well i didn't shoot really before the pandemic so i i don't yeah, really have anything to compare to um <laughs> But I uh, like I was I was in New York in June with Leica. They brought me to New York to speak at Photoville on a panel. So that was really fantastic. I loved that. Mm -hmm. um, during the summer, I mostly try to hang out here in the mountains and just do some some big trips into the mountains, like the one I was referring to uh, on Monday. And Canada is really beautiful in the summer, so definitely mm -hmm. stay here yeah. um you know in my dream world uh eventually i'll make connections with a gallery in europe or something and mm -hmm. you know make that happen and travel there mm -hmm. at this point i don't have as much travel scheduled um i'm going i am however going to bolivia in january on a photography expedition mm -hmm. um or almost three weeks i think so i'm very excited mm -hmm. to get in that brand new or new to me scenery and see what yeah. i can create there oh that'd be really cool yeah seeing, seeing new places is always fun it's yeah. very refreshing isn't it like I, it's refreshing and it's inspiring to yes. kind of create have this new palette to create with mm. yeah, yeah, yeah i where i live in the highlands we are surrounded by trees like literally our house is surrounded by trees and so okay. i photograph a lot of trees and then recently i was traveling to the us and it was I was looking forward to it was for work, but I was just looking forward mm -hmm. to the opportunity to take photos of things that weren't trees. It was yeah. going to be quite nice. Like, right, there's going to be some hard lines and shapes and shadows yeah. and just different, yeah, yeah. different faces. You know? And was did you get what you wanted or what you were hoping yeah. for? Yeah, yeah, I did. Well, I, I traveled. I've done so much travel recently and I was in Crete as well. And the light right. there yeah. was astonishing. Oh, that's just, amazing. Just it makes it fills every frame in a way that just the the light in scotland i mean i'm looking up now there's actual sun and, and and sky but the the light here often is gray cloud which basically is like a giant right. softbox mm -hmm. world mm -hmm. um and i was talking to my friend mel who's on the, an earlier episode of the podcast about this because she's from australia originally and when and there you learn to shoot a lot with a flash because the light is so harsh that you need to right. fill subjects to kind of balance you can if you've got shadow 
you you're either using the shadow to be a really really sharp contrast because like it's just blue skies hot and sunny there's no escape from right. the sun right 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 um, so it was interesting to kind of just shoot in very different conditions and Crete was like that where the light was astonishing especially at sunset just the pinks mm. and the oranges yeah. it's very very salmon colored whereas sunset here tends to be a bit more orange i think i'm i'm thinking recently because we moved here a year ago uh from lower down in britain okay. so like in north yorkshire yeah. and i think your angle on the globe affects the the angle of the light i think affects I think so. like the way the sunsets and stuff work or at least that's my working theory because the sunsets here are just different they just hit different the sky colors are different right uh and crete was that again when we were there so but yeah i've been to sweden and the us and greece this year for various work and family commitments and, and are you shooting in all those places yeah yeah the camera my mm -hmm. i have my my camera is with me all the time the, Wonderful. the M just comes everywhere and yeah. i have a little have a little 35 Zeiss that I like because it's small. Uh, mm -hmm. It's only an F28, I say only, but um, I like it. I, I That's my trade-off for me. Like the the some of the Sumalux lenses that Leica make are, oh, especially for the MC, I mean, they're small by comparison to like an SL and L mount lens, but the the M mount kind of teeny tiny lenses, they, they start to get a bit longer. You, you get right. 50 mil lenses that are sort of similar size to a 90 and they're heavy and and they right. you know you, so it's a question then of do i need to go down to 1.4 or actually if you're focusing with a rangefinder patch and you're focusing maybe it's like do i you know some, mm. sometimes something needs to be in focus and maybe i'm not doing i'm not doing a portrait on a tripod i'm sort of yeah. finding scenes that i like finding textures and things like that but mm -hmm. um but that will change i've got a project i'm sort of working on putting together at the moment so that will oh that's that exciting will probably change yeah it's it's gonna put me right out of my comfort zone which is quite good but, mm -hmm. um oh yeah. that'll be a really cool project how long are you thinking yeah. that's gonna kind of go on for well could be so here's the thing video games are a very secretive industry and right. so there is going to be a there's going to be i'm gonna have to get in in first instance and i'm gonna have to like earn people's trust and kind of show mm -hmm. that I can I'm good for it I'm gonna to have to find studios that would let me do it I'm gonna to have to find ways to get there because I don't know where in the world they will be There's so all it could be quite a process yes yes okay. and I'm thinking I'll probably start with portraits and sort of ask if mm -hmm. I can make a series of portraits of people and that's the bit that will push me probably most out of my comfort zone because I don't tend to pause and get a portrait of of someone and try and develop so that's mm -hmm. a totally new skill that I'm going oh, to that's have to fun. learn. Yeah. 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 That's so great. We'll, we'll check in again in about 10 years when I've, <laughs> I think, because it, it could be that long. It could be. Uh, no, I don't think it'll take that long. You'll be, well, you'll be great. Oh, thank you. I hope so. Well, and plus games take that long to make sometimes. So yeah, that's crazy. You know, yeah. yeah. It's, it's funny. Even 10 years ago, they used to, we used to talk about a game that took three years being ages. And now they will routinely take four you know, just to, there's wow. just, they're just so complex. There's so many people involved in making them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they've yeah. certainly come a long way since like the Sega Genesis of the nineties. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We were playing Bomberman 94 tonight as a family. Uh, okay. That time, uh, which uh, it struck me how old that is. Cause the year is in the title. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can't <like>, oh, know. <laughs> do your sons so like video good. games? They do. I'm afraid I'm a, because I'm the guy that pedals crack and I saw sort of, <laughs> so I kind of uh, like I've I've made them love it. But they also love photography, which is really nice. Oh so good. They, they, they there is a, a Venn diagram overlap of like things I like that they like. And yeah. my, my youngest really he has an old Fuji that he really loves shooting with. So we play a lot of oh, games and we, we take a lot of photos and uh, yeah, it's really nice. I hope some of it sticks. I hope I hope mm -hmm. I mean the video games probably will, right? They yeah. they do just love them and their friends play them. Uh, but yeah. I'm hoping that like photography and I love MotoGP and sport and things. So I'm hoping that they, they carry some of those. Do you think any of yours are going to pick up a camera now that you're in it? Or um, it, well, it my late? youngest daughter, my 14 year old, uh, she has my old Fuji, my mm -hmm. old little mm -hmm. Fuji that nice. she is using and, yeah. um, she likes it. It's not quite as simple as just using her iPhone camera. So yeah that can be that's a little more frustrating for her i think but I, she's they're both my daughters are pretty artistic one paints and one likes to take photos so oh, amazing that's yeah. great yeah yeah no, that's really nice it's the gift we can give them i hope is just exposing them to different things 
Yeah, absolutely. And, and letting them know that creativity is, is in all of us and we just have to yes. figure out how to express it, what way feels best for us to express it. So, yeah. Yeah. To get those little yeah. wins, that feeling yeah. of I made this and yeah, the, exactly. you know, share it some way. No, it's lovely. Oh, yeah. brilliant. Well, that seems like a lovely sort of point to wrap it up and end it on really. I didn't get to asking what an Anemo bar is. But, um, oh, and the Nanaimo bar. Oh, Nanaimo. I can tell you about that. Yeah, yeah, because that was okay, like a so, fascinating ice cream. I was just, I, yeah. Uh, Nanaimo <laughs> bars are fantastic. So they're like a little chocolatey base, usually mm. with uh, walnuts, maybe sometimes coconut in the chocolate oh, base. Okay. Um, like, like a brownie base, kind of brownie okay. texture, but maybe a little more dense. And then there's a yellow custard in between. Um, oh, I so believe nice. it's called like bird's custard or something. Yes. And then along top is a is a thin layer of um just pure chocolate and it is the most canadian of desserts besides butter tarts which are also delicious nice. and everyone in canada is quite passionate about nanaimo bars excellent so, yeah i love they're that. so I good as well that's great <laughs> it, the bird's custard is key my granddad uh, instilled in me at a young age uh, a total love of bird's custard uh, oh so good it's tremendous yeah oh, i've hated Oh, really? I have to kind of sneak. Oh, yeah, I have to sneak it in occasionally. It's, just, it's, just, it's really nice. And she's like, I'm like, you know, rhubarb crumble or something like that, like the tartness of the rhubarb, and then the, oh, bird, the sweetness yeah. of the custard. On top yeah, of and one thing about Nanaimo bars, they're very sweet. So unless you really want to feel like you're flying to the moon, you got to have small doses. Okay. <laughs> Are they served then as like a big dessert, and you cut bits off? Yeah. Is that how? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So like a big I was imagining sheet. it was like a Snickers or something, but that's no, no, it's it's like a layered thing, and then you cut it into bars. Nice. Yeah, okay. <laughs> that's on the list. I'm gonna look at the recipe. Yeah, yeah I love to no, cook, you should so, definitely make yeah. some, and then tell me how they turn out. Yes, yes. Well, you you will definitely get bombarded with my awful monstrosity. It'd be like when I learned pizza during the pandemic, and you, just, you can see these all, <laughs> as they progress to being actually acceptable looking food. Oh, that's funny. The early ones, oh mate, I was looking. They, they are five years ago. They show up. I use a diary app, and it shows me pictures from like this day in the past. Yeah. And the pizza I made, I think five or six years ago today, I I wouldn't serve anyone now. Just, <laughs> we I all was start so somewhere. Proud of it. Yeah. Whether it's so proud of photos it. or pizza, we all yeah, start yeah. somewhere. <laughs> we did. Brilliant. Oh well, thanks so much, Stasha. I really oh, enjoyed that. You. Yeah. That was a lovely thank you. conversation. That was fun. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you want to point anyone anywhere before? before we sign off oh sure um i definitely i have my website stasha um my instagram stasha dot schmidt i think is the mm -hmm. my instagram handle and uh then i have a sub stack i think it's just stasha schmidt i don't remember <laughs> makes you easy to find i'm the same i'm Ian no. Carroll everywhere yeah keep it simple yeah exactly cool all right well have a lovely rest of the day thank you you as well ian we'll talk Thanks soon take care bye ciao Thanks again to Stasha for taking the time to talk there. That was a good one. I enjoyed that. Lots of printing chat. Very nice. Uh, if you enjoyed the conversation, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast. If you haven't already, you can subscribe on Apple Podcast or Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. There's links in the show notes for that. And you can sign up for a newsletter if you want to find out more about some of the topics we touched on. Uh, I do a weekly newsletter on a Wednesday that has links to things we talk about in the previous episode. And there's a little reminder in case you haven't listened to it yet. It's all very good. If you like the show, hit us with a five-star review, tell a friend, send me an email. I love to hear from listeners. It's really nice. That'll do then. Uh, have a great week. And let's do this again next week. It was fun. See you later. <laughs>